Welcome everybody to Design at Large, the winter 2022 lecture series of the Design Lab at UC San Diego. I am uh, first going to acknowledge that we are on Kumeyaay land here at, at UC San Diego and um, Kumeyaay land and sky for, for today's lecture with Nadia Pineda and Ale de, de la Puente. Um, we will be having a, a kind of interesting dialogue that is going to be something of an artist talk performance historical presentation that originally was um, designed to be a kind of a uh, workshop to end in a workshop with all of us um, and has uh, kind of morphed because of Zoom into a Zoom performance and presentation. So, um, the talk will be from the sky to the ocean floor, prompted by a set of instructions for recording a lunar eclipse predicted to occur on uh, 19th of June, 1581. Ale de la Puente and Nidia Pineda started a project to transform an imperial mapping enterprise of data gathered into a creative process based on shared observation. They will be reconstructing a scientific log book that collates the experiences of 65 observers who enacted these historical instructions in Mexico, California, and China. The words and images that resulted from this process resignify abstract diagrams of space and time as unregimented spaces of affect, intimacy, physical labor, and social interaction. Most importantly, these enactments inform future imaginations of a celestial spectacle that should happen in April of the year 15,232. So I wanted to read the entire abstract before they give their talk because this, this lecture today is very important for those of us in speculative design to think about ways to do historical speculative design in um, collaboration between uh, the practice of history as a practice that involves not just writing, but also visual and graphical and digital work and material objects together with art practice. Uh, so we're going to be hearing from, uh, in, a, in a kind of interactive dialogue from Nidea Pineda de Avia, who is a professor in the Department of History at UC San Diego, as well as a professor in the Science Studies program here. She is currently a Fletcher Jones Fellow at the Huntington Library in Los Angeles, which is a uh, world-renowned institution of uh, uh, an archive and a place for dialogue about the history of science on uh, beautiful garden grounds in the Pasadena area of Los Angeles. Born in Mexico, Nadia Pineda de Avia went on, uh, studied a BA in French literature in Mexico and went on to complete a master's and a PhD uh, at the University of London. And she has spoken all over the world uh, and uh, in, in Europe and in the United States, in, in South America. And she has done extensive work with the John Carter Brown Library where she has co-curated co digital exhibitions, uh, specifically a work called Constellations, Reimagining Celestial Histories in the Early Americas. And I would invite you all to look at this work. Uh, again, Constellations, Reimagining Celestial Histories in the Early Americas at the John Carter, uh, at the John Carter Brown Library website. Nadia Pineda works at the intersections of history of science, history of the book, visual studies, and she investigates the gap among practice, theory, and representation in images of space and time in early modernity. And her work is informed by the study of archives and libraries, as well as through very concrete practice-based research in material things. She takes her students out into the field to do uh, field work with actual notebooks. She's completing a manuscript that reveals the changing values of moon maps as visual experiments, technical instruments and commodities, and uh, looking at the early phases of the development of a telescope. And she's in the construction of a knowledge-based uh, work on 
astronomical images and data visualization with a historian, historian of science in Brazil and computer sciences and designers in Mexico. She's a very uh, big collaborator and initiator of uh, international and interdisciplinary projects, notably a project called American Skies, which spans researchers in Chile, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and the US, as well as in England and the United States and Italy. Um, she has been working since 2008 with the artist Ale de la Puente. Ale de la Puente is an artist with a very broad background in interdisciplinary studies, including design, boat building, navigation, astronomy, physics, and philosophy. She's known for her poetic and conceptual explorations of time and space across a wide field of media, ranging from installation and sculpture to drawing, photography, and video. And uh, she has done a, a lot of work in the field around how we signify natural phenomena, how we relate and give meaning to uh, natural phenomena in the world. She's had numerous uh, fellowships and residences, residencies developing art projects um, at the Astronomy Institute, the Nuclear Science Institute at UNAM, uh, Cosmica Institute, collaborating with scientists to carry out projects uh, ranging from matters of gravity uh, to work on, on lightning. And uh, she's worked uh, around uh, the research at CERN as a visitor there as well. She's exhibited in international venues uh, all over Mexico, the United States, Moscow, Slovenia, uh, Madrid, Tokyo, Japan. So um, I will turn it over to Ale and Nadia and uh, please give them a warm welcome to the Design Lab at UCSD. Thank you, Lisa. <coughs> I'm gonna share the screen. Cloudy, I couldn't find the moon. No moon, nor any star, cold, bushes at the park. Everything was orange due to a light post. I wasn't able to see the moon or stars. Lizards scurrying around, some couple walking on a dirt trail. I decided to draw a tree because I could not see the moon. Too cloudy, a large group of crows in a tree. The sky feels cold and lifeless as I find more artificial lights. The moon is disheartened. More clouds have started rolling in. I caught a glimpse of the moon in the early morning. I can see the moon. It looks so fake. I never thought about how most of the time, after the sun starts to set, clouds start rolling from the west, the coast. Today, I sat on a tree waiting to see the moon. According to the internet, it should have been in the sky. I learned the moon was not visible because it was getting closer to the new moon phase. After two days of looking for the moon, I asked my mom if she had seen it, as she spent a lot of time outside in the garden. A really peaceful night, not too cold or windy. I heard a lot of people walking up and down the street with their dogs. It was too cloudy to see the moon today, so I'm trying to observe my surroundings. I would wake up extra early to see the moon. However, I'll fail. Today, I drew this wall, wall in my backyard. Sky was dark, flowers in front of the wall. The sky had a yellow white glow. It was extra quiet tonight, so I sat, out, sat outside for an additional 10 minutes to relax and appreciate the quiet. I could not tell if it was just too cloudy or if the moon just was invisible. The moon is nowhere to be seen. 
I have looked around day and night. I can see why past cultures notice this part of the cycle as the creation of the new moon. If I had only observed today, I would tell you, we had no moon. I hear the frogs today, possibly two. I forget how the sky here doesn't really appear black, light pollution. It is more like purple. Despite some light pollution from the surrounding apartment buildings, I could see the moon and some stars across La Jolla coast. The moon was finally visible in crescent form today, but clouds again came along with a cool breeze to block the moon. I was able to appreciate even a little pictures, such as being able to see. The silver of the crescent moon was to be seen. The wind was chilly and temperature was cold. Its light from behind the clouds reveals its location. Frustrating. It will be rewarding if to finally see it. Frogs and crickets behind me chirping away constantly, consistently, like nature's clock ticking away. Very clear sky, allowing me to see the waxing crescent moon along with many stars. Very low clouds covering the majority of the sky. Cloudy, today has been the first day I have been able to see the moon. Today was a great night to see the moon. It is cool 61 Fahrenheit with a very light wind blowing north to south. Air was very chilly and violent. I did not have a jacket. Super rainy. After doing a 360 panoramic scan of the sky, there was no sign or indications of the moon. A faint light behind the cloud for the first time, the first progress towards observing the moon since the past week. I've been noticing how birds have their own cycle. Two of them are building a nest outside my house. I am excited to observe this progress as I continue my daily observations. Still cannot see anything, but my classmates seem to be able to see the moon. I took my little sister out with me. I think this is the first time she has consciously observed the moon. The lunar eclipse is exactly a week away. Time to get preparations done. I went to get something out of my car this evening and the night was unbelievably clear. So I got to see the moon bright and clear. Rain clouds. Clear skies, moon very visible. A stressful day, but just taking a break to observe the peaceful night sky has been a nice break. A night sky about 90% covered with patches amongst the clouds resembles sort of the ripples of waves. Tons of crickets. I could see the sun and the moon at the same time, something I never really thought of. At last, the moon briefly makes an appearance. From here on, the moon is only going to shine brighter, something big is going to happen, but we already know. Dark, clouds and cold. I hope that I can see the moon soon. Yet again, another day of observation and the moon is still not in sight. No clouds. I could see the moon very clearly. Half of the moon is visible. The blanket of clouds blocking out the moon and stars. I think a lot of us take the existence of the moon for granted. Just like the moon, we go through phases. I got the moon. I always forget how bright the moon can be. Even though it was still pretty cloudy, the moon was visible again. This makes me optimistic for the eclipse. I wonder if I ever know when I'm close with half my life. Should I know? Probably not. The board look great. Can't wait to see how these measurements will go tomorrow. The moon was beautiful. The moon is the brightest it has been. 
the thick layer of clouds and extreme light pollution only exacerbated my exhausted mood. I finally realized that there were online resources that know where and when the moon is out at any time. I had forgotten how otherworldly it looks to see another celestial body, a strange gut feeling of the vastness of space. I finally got to see the moon as it shines bright in the damn clear skies tonight. The night was average quiet with only the sounds of crickets and occasional cars. I am up late getting tacos with my friends. Um, I am happy and content. The moon seems happy as well. Few clouds scattered around me, very little wind and a few bees roaming around me. I can see the craters of the moon. The clouds were pretty heavy tonight, the moon occasionally peaking. The moon almost hurt to look at. This eclipse will have a super moon that, will, that makes me biased towards thinking it's a bigger moon. Clouds plus new idea to make a board without any signs of the moon. I go to Home Depot website to look for what I need. It was my mother's birthday today and my family friend gave her a moon cake. I think that even though this is a largely a solitary project going outside every night to observe the moon, there is a sense of community. We all look at the same moon from so many different places. The moon feels content, almost lazy today. So I feel like the moon is telling me to relax too. It is beautiful how cyclical the moon is. It makes me wonder what else in life is repetitive. I calculated the meridian line as it makes the shadows that the sun casts throughout the day. I was able to see the sun move across the sky as it faded and the moon started to illuminate. Wow, the clouds are gone tonight. Hope fully the sky is this clear during the eclipse. Working on the first instrument, I'm going to get slight sunburned. It's incredible the amount of light that gets reflected off the surface of the moon from the sun. I have set up my instrument. The six hours I spent were a lot of fun and felt like an hour. The great people I met, my first time having prolonged interaction with a stranger, classmate, is a really long time, COVID. It was even brighter than a nearby lamppost. Whoa. The shadow looks like it will touch the outer circle soon. The shadow just passed the first circle some minutes ago. The first recording of the shadow passed the first circle at 8.30 roughly. The shadow passed the outer circle at 4.56 p.m. The shadow crossed the second circle at 5 p.m. Outer circle was crossed at around 4.50 p.m. Had to move around a bit to get away from some expected shadows. I couldn't find a complete platform to put my paper on because I had to penetrate my chopsticks at the middle of the paper. Found the meridian. Tonight feels ominous, like the beginning of an evil plot. No joke. The clouds surrounding the moon look scary. Ready for the lunar eclipse tonight. Other than trying to get the board straighter, better aligned. I had to do makeshift sick with some pens and electric tape I had on hand. There's not many resources here. Hopefully, some of my apartment mates will be here to be witnesses before they go to bed. Really cloudy today, but I was able to get a shot before the eclipse. I don't think I've ever seen a brighter moon today. I can't wait for the lunar eclipse in a few hours. I have my second instrument ready no string around, so I may do with a pen and some zip ties. Going to keep my sister up to be an observer. We're all at the top of Keeling to observe the eclipse. Eclipse night, moon party in full swing, brought my dog. Great success. Pretty cloudy where I'm at. 
can't really see the moon at the moment. We just propped up the board. Ready for the eclipse, I used some shoes to help prop up my instrument. The moon doesn't want to show itself clearly, joy. The sky is really cloudy. The moon is gone and I can't see nothing. Still very cloudy. The moon wants to play hide and seek. Eclipse is now completely blocked for the past 30 minutes. Weather, not too cloudy. Don Kim and I have our instruments ready and we ob observe the eclipse. The moon is completely covered in clouds. Witnesses are sad. The marine layer decided to be late to the party and we can't see the moon as of right now. The moon is extremely bright tonight. We made our first mark. The clouds went away. Other than a few peeps through the clouds in the past 30 minutes or so, the moon is completely covered. Really disappointing as the number of mosquito bites I can already feel. Same problem here, nothing to observe. In a moment, I got a chance to see the moon and my stick shadow at 2.19 a.m. Kind of hard to see, but with the clouds clearing up a little bit, I'm able to see the shadow from my dowel. What gonna happen if we were not able to see the eclipse cause of the clouds? The shadow of the stick, which used to be strong, is greatly diminished, so we have concluded that the moon is less bright. The moon came out for 30 seconds, then disappeared again, but not enough time to make a mark. The eclipse has started, observing from Sonoma with Nina Yan. A majority of the moon has been eaten up. It is noticeably dimmer and the air has gotten much colder. My pictures do not do it justice. The moon is half eclipsed at this point in time. Part of the moon that is in the shadow is glowing faintly red. Some birds woke up and are chirping. The banana shaped moon is on its last legs. The moon is completely hidden. Clouds have been covering the moon since 3.30 a.m. So I could not see the eclipse progression very well. The eclipse has been completely covered by thick clouds for the past 30 minutes. There is a silver moon left. My cat came to investigate the birds. The clouds covered it before the eclipse happened. It was the ultimate insult and gave us false hope. A mark could not be made. I hate my camera and the hand that holds it. Kind of sleepy by now, being honest, but the war and raccoons are keeping me company. The moon is regaining its brightness, starting from the top. The moon appears close to setting. It seems we won't be able to make the second mark. The sun's coming. It rained all day and turned cloudy at night in Yanying. According to the forecast, the moon eclipse would have happened at about 7 p.m., but it was cloudy. So I decided to make a self-made observation at home. Because there was no sunlight during the day, I only got one intersection on the first instrument yesterday. I chose to cheat with the compass on my phone. The hope was shattered by the clouds tonight. For about a year and a half, I hadn't been able to see other students in person. The moon was the biggest, roundest and brightest I ever seen. It's incredible. With no winds, with no clouds, this observation felt like a still frame out of a movie. I'm tired of and dying from staying up last night. I think the word is ephemeral. The moon gradually rose behind some mountains in the east, and it was a wonderful way to end this observation process and notebook. It's bittersweet. Well, thank you for following us. We're going to now tell you who we are, where we're coming from, where we meet. So I'm a historian of early modern science and I'm interested in making reading and um, mobilizing the mobilization of astronomical images, especially in the 17th century and especially in relation with the development of the telescope. 
And I've dedicated the last 10 years or so to studying lunar maps, also called selenographies, and the interactions between artists and natural philosophers, the process of observing, drawing, translating experience into legible, coded, yet always intriguing and all unresolved images. So the process of knowledge making from observing and drawing. And I'm interested in the uses of the images. So that way I began to be interested in pre-telescopic observations. So the prehistory of lunar maps as instruments, lunar maps as instruments for geography, for the calculation of longitude, so for geopolitics. And that way also I became interested in environmental history and in instruments for the creation of, of environmental representations. Ali. So how we meet? <laughs> we meet um, when I invite Nidia to, to be part of a, a talk in an, an exhibition I was having. And the exhibition involved some, some works that deals with the sky and that's why someone recommends me Nidia but when we started that conversation it have ever stopped. No. One of the pieces I was I am interested always in the relation of time and space and how we measure time. I believe like there are conceptions that the more diversity we have of them the more enriched our vision of the world is. So it's not that we have to find one just one way to see time or to see space. So one of the projects, for example, was this one that I had uh, planned to navigate in the line of the equator, in the cer parallel zero. And we were navigating, we were a group, multidisciplinary group on the day of the equinox of autumn. And the idea was to be there without no sight of land in the moment when the sun was completely on the zenith. And at that moment, we covered the, the boat, the sailboat, with uh, mylar so it can reflect the light. And there was also a satellite involved that was going to be like in the same line, the sun, the satellite, the sailboat, and the center of the earth. In the idea of it was a time of coincidence, a time where that's the only moment in time and space that you can be completely lost on land because there's no land on, on site and there's no way the sun can tell you where you are. So this is a satellite photograph, but if you go closer and closer, you can see there's a spot, a very small spot in the, in the photograph that is reflecting the sun. So it's not the sailboat, it's the sun reflected on the sailboat that I was aiming for. In my collaborations, I'm always trying to collaborate with setting some questions. And these questions can make me go to expeditions to do some works of, um, of uh, construction. On, and the example is this machine that the idea of this machine is kind of a clock, but it doesn't record time or make time or follow time, but it produces time producing sound. And it was collaboration to make, trying to make a sense of the cosmic moments of coincidence. Also in my collaboration that we'll see following in this talk, it's about uh, the possibility that gave me to see some special astronomical events. In this case, the transit of Venus in 2012. But how to question these, these, um, these events without the eyes of the scientific, um, the scientific experience, but more like why we see the transit of Venus. In this case, we see it because we are looking from Earth, but if Venus was the center, there will not be a transit. Or maybe if Venus is fixed, then we will see in this moment, the song goes around it. Right? So my, my, my work is more about collaboration and questions and constructing or expeditions or some, or else. Huh? So when Ale and I first met, I was doing um, 
a short um, residency at the John Carter Brown Library, which is uh, a library housed in Brown University that holds one of the largest Latin American collections in the world. And the story of that repository is really entangled with the dispersion of national collections of Latin America, um, stories of forgery, sto stories of theft, and stories of um, in very complex international relations and sales. And um, in this library, I find a set of instructions for a 1582 observation for the 1582 observation of a lunar eclipse. So these instructions are part of a project of imperial mapping made through data collecting in the colonies. The idea of these instructions is to, um, the instructions are officially signed by Philip II, King of Spain. Of course, he wasn't the author of these instructions. The author was probably the cosmographer who led the Council of Indies in Seville. Now, these, collection, these instructions tell colonial authorities in towns and villages of the Indies to make an instrument for the recording of, uh, so of a lunar eclipse, and they tell them to produce a diagram, a drawing. And then to send that drawing to the Council of Indies, which would be like a center of information processing, and the cosmographers in the Council of Indies would make a map of the Spanish Empire. So that, in theory, sounds great. And um, it was an extremely complicated project that did not lead to an enhanced map of the Spanish Empire. And um, however, the process is extremely interesting, and um, a lot of cosmological theory was put into the making of these instructions. So you, um, behind this document, there is knowledge that the world is a globe. There is knowledge that different observers looking at the same time from different placed, places would create data that would um, allow cosmographers to locate different positions on the globe and the relationship between places. Um, but these, all these bits of knowledge are tacit, right? So colonial officials, learned or not, had just to follow them and send the diagrams to Spain. And astronomical observation then turned into a process of bureaucracy. Um, there are very, very few rare copies of the replies that were sent uh, in response to these instructions. But one cosmographer that went from Spain to Mexico and then to the Philippines did perform them in 1680 80 and 85. So these instructions are also linked to the history of the exploration of the Pacific. Anyway, my first thought when I started reading these instructions and trying to understand them was to give them to Ale to see how, with her help, we could think about the bodily processes that were required to, uh, to undertake them. So Nidia gave me the instructions and trying to read at them, I say trying because they are in old Spanish. You have to translate the instructions to contemporary Spanish. But also the instructions include how to build this instrument in a very ambiguous way, but in very precise way at the same time. You know? And so I told me, you know, so let's do it. And let's do this, follow the instructions in the clips of January 20 in 2019. So the first thing was to translate the, the instructions, try to understand what they were trying to, to say because they, they say it at the same time in very long sentences, very long way to explain how to construct this instrument, but with many options. And the, the sizes that they were, they were saying to how the size should have a pneumon, that which size it could, should be, there are sizes that we are not using, actually, no? 
is the lead. So we have to first look for the place where to see it. It was in Mexico City. In, and we found the terrace of the Astronomy Institute at UNAM. We asked for some permission and we asked some astronomers if they want to follow us. This required a whole time to follow the instructions. You have to build the, the board, build the instrument and follow the sun and the, the sun's shadow from the moment it rises to the moment it goes down. So you spend the whole day on the terrace, like you, and you have to have witnesses. So we try to invite witnesses. Some of them came over for the clips, but it's the following every moment, trying to build after after finding the after following the sun shadow, we have to build the second instrument that is done with the same boards. Supposedly, it can be one or, or two, and set it on the meridian line, and then set it perfectly vertical, and prepare it to the time when the moon appears. When the moon appears and, and rises, there's a beautiful line in the text, in the instructions that says that you have to agree with the witnesses that it's completely round and that is not desfalcada maybe i don't know the word desfalcada in english um, like bitten or something like that yeah but in spanish it's a beautiful word because we don't use it anymore it's like it fails and then the moment when the clips start you have to set the shadow and then the clips happen and then it's this marvelous o of doesn't caring what is following the instruction, the instruction is, but it leads you to this, this moment. So this um, enactment, this historical enactment, really informed our historical understanding of the instructions. And I want to say that histor uh, material enactment can inform a historical imagination that is much needed, I think, in interpretation. And it made us aware of the complex material, social and environmental conditions that must have been really crucial in the imperial mapping project. And for instance, half of the instructions, four paragraphs, one page, contain 12 hours. That we didn't know until we spent those 12 hours looking at the shadows of the sun from dawn to dusk. It, they involve a lot of active waiting. The other half of the instructions, so the other 12 hours of a 24 hour day, is just waiting for the moon to rise and cast shadows. So everything that happens around the actual recording of the um, what we call astronomical observation has to do with what happens on Earth between each other in our interactions. And that was a it sounds quite obvious, but it was a very um, embodied understanding, and it's a, it was a real lesson, I would say. Um, we also learned just how ambiguous the wording of an instruction is. Well, we can talk about, we could do a seminar on instructions, just how, how, um, how layered they are, how ideological they are, how difficult they are really to interpret. Um, and we came to appreciate just how much work labor is silenced in a diagram. Um, so in a diagram, there actually exists in this type of diagram an enhanced per perception of presence, space, and time of locality. Um, so we actually did not become disembodied cosmographers. We were very much um, locally based and, and challenged observers. And the outcome of the diagram for me, it was a complete surprise you know, to see like this beautiful for me, like abstract geometric shapes and how they hide in there. It's encrypted all the information that they have and, and 
it's like a drawing that took a whole day to happen. You know? And for me, during the whole 24 hours or more that we spent also awake, you know, doing the whole process, in this waiting, is it's like when waiting becomes a synonym of observing and how if you're waiting and getting impatient, you don't get a chance to observe. And when you start observing, you start to create a, a creative process in yourself because it's a moment when you start translating the world to yourself, your, your object of observations, the amount of things and birds that we listen and and what happened in, in, in UNAM in this uh, rooftop of the Astronomical Institute, that in UNAM is a, is in a site in Mexico that they are, it's already very isolated in some way, but reserved, but in a way it's very close to the, to the city. And even though it was vacation weekend or it was a weekend and there was no, there was no classes at, at the university, the noises that we can listen, we can even say which town was having a party far away. So because we have been observing the whole process of how it dims up and dims down the rhythms of the day. So it was kind of being connected with a very extensive and, and, and huge space, what, where, what is the solar system, but at the same time is connecting with ourselves with the, our intimate time that we have in this moment of silence to observe. And having to write the write down, because in the instructions, there is a line that says that you have to write down what you witness, what you not. If you didn't observe, because there were clouds, you have to write it down. And the students did, and we did in that time. But the beauty of it is like what, how different and how similar each drawing of each one's, of each group that did the observations came. And what I can see in these, in these drawings, in these diagrams, it's not an astronomical information. It's more about the experience of someone spain, spending so much time observing with all their senses. And for this, well, go back, <laughs> for this, one of the the main, I have been working with observation for a long time. And one of the things that came up with this is that it's very difficult to understand what is happening if you are only doing two days of observation. We can imagine in the 16th century, someone that see the moon every day because there were no light pollution, because it's part of our life, of everyday life, that even it's part that it's when it's full moon, full moon and there's light in the night, we can gather together or not. So we are more, we, they were, we as humans were more related with the light and the moon. But today, how you understand the moon and its rhythms if you don't observe it? How many of us know now which phase of the moon we are right now tonight? Because the moon is there. And as one student says, like, we take the moon for granted. We don't know who. <laughs> And she continues in her page of observation is, I didn't understand why it's at what time in some point in the sky and another time in another point. So, but this, this book of, of, for observation, what keeps you is this, this um, possibility to make of the observation process a ritual, a ritual where you decide to take at least 10 minutes every day, just, just to observe, and that's it. And it was important that the book was beautiful, that it makes you not looking like a homework, somewhere where you have to put yourself and write there a time 
that you have lived. And it's not a diary of I went to this place or another, but it's a diary of what I have observed and how I've been connected with nature. Something else, maybe? Should I yeah, say? I, I just I want to rewind a little bit. Um, yes. Yeah, yes. Just, just to fill in some perhaps um, some gaps in the process. So after the first time we did the the, obs the lunar observation at UNAM, several um, things happened, such as the pandemic, right? <laughs> and it is during the pandemic that Ale develops the observation diary that you saw and that we gave the students. So um, this also happened at the same time when I started teaching at UCSD. So um, strangely enough, several we had several cosmic coincidences. Ale had developed the observation diary. I started working and I started teaching at UCSD and I had a class called Technology and World History and there was going to be an eclipse. So we decided to take this, these opportunities and, and, and put all these different projects together. Um, it's important to say that giving the students the notebook that Ale created and giving them the instructions and gathering their data can be compared to a process of um, data making and data gathering to a scientific process. So the observation diary wasn't just it wasn't just a personal diary where everybody just drew whatever they wanted. There was the idea that they would have an observation diary that was precisely something like a scientific logbook, but with slightly different indications. Instead of recording the temperature and precise measurements, the idea was to expand their perception and to um, invite subjective appreciations um, of, of the process towards the observation of the lunar eclipse, where they would um, follow the exact instructions of the 1582 cosmographer. And just so you have an idea of how complicated the logistics was, um, Ale had to get the books out of the print house. I boxed them up, sent them to a student in Tijuana who took them across the border. Um, students made little, uh, hubs to distribute all the notebooks in California, in different parts of San Diego, in Los Angeles, in San Francisco. Uh, there was a student who sent notebooks from San Diego to China. So this looks a lot like what um, the district, well, we can, um, we can make an analogy with what the distribution of the pamphlet, the 16th century pamphlet was. We have to imagine that there is always work behind the distribution of instructions and in the collection of data. So what we were doing with an observation diary, with cosmographical instructions, and with 65 observers was, yes, a scientific project of data collecting and gathering, but we were also making community. And that's important. Knowledge making is also a form of making community. And the students lived that. In, in their bodies. And um, when they, at first, they were watching the, from inside their houses, they were observing from inside their houses. And in the end, they were having what they called a moon party um, on campus, which was wonderful. So an intimate experience became a very collective envir environmental experience, I would say. And uh, we have a volunteer to make a discourse. So we can um, communicate, but more than for us, it was just to use it to make some questions when they have doubts. But it was amazing to see the whole conversation between them. So, and most of them, they didn't knew it, if they, each other, no? They haven't been able to get together or, or something. So there's a transformation in, in the whole process, not only the transformation of observing 
on how they observe and what they observe because they, in the reading of the more, it's about 60 notebooks, no? The 60 diaries, when you can read them, we ask them to send us like the pages of all of their entries. And what is amazing is the amount of poetry you can get there, but of the, it's like a novel of a transformation of, of individuals that becomes a community and, and how they start in, in, re, in the relation with the discord is that you know what they write, they wrote in the moment of the observation and they how they start to name in the, in the process after the clips, they name their, their classmates. And some of them, they name them before, they start to name them. They start to involve them in their observations. They start to involve their sisters and brothers and parents and friends and dogs and cats. And so it starts to become from a solitary point of view to a kind of, we are a community. So it was a beautiful result to see how it evolved during a whole month, a whole moon of observation, a moon time of observation. And trying to explain them the instructions. When we gave them the instructions, we had a, a Zoom and it was beautiful because we were not ask, asking them to buy anything. It's whatever you have on hand. And as you have seen the boards, they have been very creative and to see like, okay, I have this. And I have to mention there was someone in a military camp, no, media, yes, and yes. with no resources. So they had to find out what they had on hand so they can follow the shadow of the sun. It sounds so absurd at some point in the beginning. And I think in the beginning, also in the first Zoom, I saw them so, Someone said like, but I have to go outside and what if it's cold? No, and they were reluctant to, to really, they were not like really engaged to, okay, I have to do my homework and go outside every day and feel the cold. But at the end, I think they, they feel really happy you know? and, and they, they were willing to follow, to continue do, doing the observations. And for that time, I want to show you, we were also doing the observation and we went together, we met in the, it was not in the middle point, but we went to San Buto, that is in Baja California and is in this place. And there's Nidia. <laughs> we camped there and we have our instrument and we did it again. And even we bring the board, we bring some, some things to create the instrument there. There's also what you have on hand, how to level the board and how to follow the shadow and what means to follow the shadow. For me, it's like more, it's, it's actually a ritual when you decide, okay, this day I'm going to follow the whole day, the shadow of the sun. And I'm going to see where it ends. And I'm going to see where, where is the meridian zone, but the meridian line, but not really to find the north. I'm not looking for the north. I'm just looking for the process and what I find in the process, what I can find in this process of a ritual, almost obsessive way to follow a shadow with a seashell. And then wait for the moon to come out and prepare the prepare the second board for the shadow of the of the moon and wait for the moon to come out. So there really was a place where scientific observation and religious observation met in this idea of ritual, the sense of expectation of um, um, Meaning. Abiding to different norms mm -hmm. and giving meaning to the process, yes. And it was beautiful being there in the beach doing the observation process and receiving like all the conversations of the disco that, no, when they 
work already. We were all following the, the senses, no, and the perception of each of each of them who were all together connected. And at the same time, we really were virtual witnesses in the sense that historians of science have described early modern astronomers. So people who were located at different parts of the world at the same time, observing the same phenomena and then sharing their information. So all these different layers were at play in our experiment. Just to end, um, about halfway through that lunar phase, we discovered that there had been no lunar eclipse visible in the Spanish West Indies in 1588. So it was a false prognostication. And that made it even more magical for us because what matters is what is, is what matters are the actions oriented by the prognostications, not whether they're accurate or inaccurate. It's how they make us orient our acts and our expectations and our beliefs. And so um, that, that's an important, a very important aspect of our project. And that ties into Alice dealing with the future. Yes, and here it's also this, um, this feeling of the experience of trying to have the experience that, that what means to, to follow these instructions and, and how to have this possible sharing is at least a minimum of the, of the experience that may have had those observers in the 16th century. You know, trying to share this, this uh, expectation, the tiredness, the sun burned, that maybe we have shared the same. You know? There are some senses that may have been, we have shared them. And so there's this date, the, five, the 5th of April of the year 15,232. This is a date we found in the, with the astronomers of the Astronomy Institute. That is the date that an, an astronomical event, a fabulous astronomical event may happen. That is, it's going to happen a transit of Venus the same day that is going to be a total eclipse of the sun. So you will have the sun and then Venus will start passing in front of the sun so you can see it. And then you can, will see the moon following Venus, covering the sun, getting the clips, going out, and you're looking like the spot of Venus there. That must be a beautiful event. We search in the past if, there, if it had happened before and we couldn't find a, a date for that in the calculations more than 1,000, 100,000 years ago. So the, the nearest date is this one. And actually it's a date that will not be that date because we have to adjust the calendar. So maybe it's going to be another date no? <laughs> because of all the adjustments. So this project and, and the place where we are going to be able to see this, um, this this astronomical event. I said, we are going to see it. Like, I hope there's someone, someone wants that, uh, wants to see the, the, there will be someone that could see that event, no? It's going to be able to be seen in Baja California, in the same place where we did the last astronomical following of the structures of the eclipse. And last, uh, last year, I went to a residence that I was the artist at sea at Falkor of the o Schmidt Ocean Institute, that we did the research of how the, the peninsula of La California was, was uh, formed, that we did the research for the ter hydrothermal vents, the chimneys of the hydrothermal vents in the Pescadero Basin in the Gulf of Mex in the Gulf of California, and uh, there were, were, were 
several dives, more than 16, 17 dives that went to up to 308, 3,800 meters on the water to the ocean floor. So every day we were diving and looking underwater and the world, far away world that is on the seafloor. And, but during the day, during the night, there was this beautiful, clear sky. And I could see every day where the moon rises and where the moon sets and the stars. And here is the moon far away rising and its reflection on the sea. But when I turned back my back, I saw Venus and I saw also Venus reflecting on the sea. And that makes me wonder, like I have ever thought of the skies, of the sky being reflected in the sea so perfectly, like having the Venus rising and Venus, Venus setting, the moon rising and Venus setting. And um, so I did some photographs and, and it was just in this position when they were, when there were this, this dancing of the celestial bodies around. So part of the project of the 5th of April is going to be of what I did as a research, as the researching in, in Baja California, in the underwater world, in the chimneys, the it was a geological and biological expedition. Part of the geological expedition is how the, the, the peninsula gets separated from the continent. And part of the, the, um, the expedition was also about uh, how, what lives there beneath. And one of the things in this date of the 5th of April of 15,232, one of the questions is not about if there is a human being able to observe the, the, phenomen, the phenomena, but it's about how it's going to be Baja California. The, the weather is changing and maybe it's not going to be anymore these uh, kind of sand, uh, beautiful places. It maybe it's going to be a forest or maybe it's going to be underwater or maybe we don't know. Geologist says that it's going to, it's not going to be far. It's not going to be an island well, it's the, already. It's going to be a still a peninsula. It's a very short time in geological formation, but not in the, in the environment. So how can we prepare for that moment to observe it in a way as a ritual? So I'm working in these uh, diagrams that, that keeps me a, a possibility of the rhythm that I'm going to follow. It's going to be a multimedia artwork. I'm working with a com compos and composer, musician, composer, Emilio Hinojosa. We created this diagram with already the year that we are going to follow in this year. We're starting to follow it on the 21st of March and we are going to observe two eclipses, the first in May and another in November in Baja California again and try to follow like what is our observations every day to inform how we are going to compose a 365 days of observation with the different moon cycles and the Venus cycle and the eclipses and the, the seasons that we don't have spring, summer, autumn and fall. We have more like hurricane seasons and rainy seasons and the north wind seasons and the dry season. So and how they mix together. And that are part of, of our process that we are working. And I'm going to work with all the information I gathered and the film, the footage I gather in the underwater, in the on the in the seafloor of the Gulf of California. That is kind of a stopping time in a way that is the horizon is not like the future the past inform the future or the way we see the future inform the, uh, the past that we, how we tell us our stories, but it's like time is, is practically our horizon and, and we create with it space. And the main idea to this, uh, 
this um, project of the 5th of April is to film in also in Baja California these the bends on the sky, but also the bends on the on the dunes and the bends where we can feel and and try to imagine ourselves in this future time. And it's in process. No, it's going to be for 2023. I think that's it. Amazing. There is so much to talk about in all of these presentations. Uh, would you like to um, end the screen sharing See, or shall we continue in the, okay. I'm doing it, but I don't find my mouse. But I can do this. Yeah, I disappear, no? There, there were so many parts. Yeah. To, there were so many parts to the talk that I don't even know where to begin. Thank you, Nadia Pineda and Ale de la Puente for just an incredibly rich demonstration of the collaboration that you've been doing for so many years now and the focus on uh, the reenactment with the students, the building of the instruments, um, the different ways in which you combine um, digital design and, and uh, analytics with hands-on work. Um, a couple of things to pull out. Nydia's comment that um, she began to hate her camera and the relationship to the hand and the, 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 um, the way in which we differently understand instruments when we begin to use them and when we take the historical record as something that doesn't give us truths about what happened, but we understand it as an interpretation and possibly a script for the future and also a script for a, a re-understanding of the past that can inform the present and the way it's been shaped by, by a misunderstanding of those documents around the way that empire scripts itself to justify itself and the way that we can re-script and descript through a performative redoing that allows us to see the fictions, mm -hmm. the speculative fictions that constructed the justification for empire. So I hope I've captured that for you, Nadia, in, in some generalized way. I'm sorry for reducing it to sort of soundbite-ish um, comment. But the ways in which we then segued into Ale's uh, presentation at first of the instrumentation and the way that centeredness and, and data becomes constructed through the building of these tools that are very much about paper and tracking that goes back to, to early historical methods that are flawed and that still inform the, the contemporary practice and the way that Ale is engaged right now in trying to use the ocean as a mirror, the ocean as a way of understanding the skies and the way in which that becomes like a graph that she's tracking with scientists with whom she was on the expedition and also with, with Nydia in terms of understanding things historically. So I'm just putting out some ideas, but I wanna begin with a question for you about empire and knowledge systems. There was a very strong slide for me where Nydia talked about the, the emotional and affective aspects of empire. And I'm wondering, Nadia, if you could talk more about that related to the way that affect is not just something that spontaneously comes to us, but is scripted and performed to perform certain outcomes. Maybe through measurement or through the design of tools. Yeah. So the history of empire and certainly the history of the Spanish empire is told through bureaucracy, through paperwork. So through um, documents such as these diagrams that silence the experience of making the diagrams. And I think something that historians have to do is put themselves in the position, not of the people who receive the diagrams and stitch the pieces together, but trying to imagine what the un 
on the ground observation processes were like, where the, that, where the empire doesn't matter, where the empire is the context actually for the social interactions and the, yeah, the, the bodily interactions with the environment. So we can tell many stories within the history of empire. That's the first thing I have to say. And it, it doesn't always have to be about power and domination. It just, it, I think we need to think about giving the agency back, right? To all the parties. And when we think about that, well, that we have a problem because there are silences in the archives. And that's where enactment can come in and help because because we're humans and we have bodies. And if we experience just, we will never understand exactly what people in the 16th century felt, but we can put waiting back into the story. We can put expectation back into the story. You can put frustration back into the story. And not only because Spanish officials wouldn't have delivered the information they were asked to deliver, but because they were in the sun or in the cold night and interacting with the people around them, trying to make sense of shadows and the night. And I think those are the stories that we can rescue to, to change, to change the very sort of directed readings of the history of empire. Not to say that we're going to take power out of the question, not at all. We're just going to layer it a bit more. Um, would anyone like to respond to that very provocative su suggestion that Nidhi is making, which is that we would not always, we should not always have to talk about power. Anybody? Ale, would you like to? In the sense of hierarchies, I mean. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Anybody want to respond? I, I think it's, I think it's very provocative because we can also think about um, power, the way that you're describing it seems to be about the, the questions of power that are, are mundane and that occur through individuals who just work at particular tasks that are boring and where you get cold and you get hungry and your, your equipment breaks down and it's hard to use and you have to fix it and it goes wrong. And I see that as being very much about power, but at the very micro level of experience and interaction over time, maybe. Yes, yes. I think it's those micro, those micro levels that will help us really understand um, the agency of the different actors, the real agency and power. So, so something that struck me very strongly in your presentation is the way in which Ali's work coming into the picture and also Nidia, your drawing and your engagement with, with um, the notebooks and the question of keeping logs that you both introduce a truly compelling empirical record of what amounts to an analysis of the way that work is conducted and the way that uh, work is conducted also in the rescripting of it by making paper documents that then reflect the work and how it becomes uh, kind of iterative in that way. Um, so Ale, I think it's fairly unusual for an artist to work at this level of specificity with the way knowledge gets produced. And so um, I was wondering if you could talk, given that we have a number of art students and artists on the Zoom today, if you could talk a little bit about what it's like to work with scientists uh, on a project that is both engaging in the science, but also on some level uh, reflexively critiquing the, the tools that aim for a certain kinds of, of outcomes that maybe uh, that you would want to leave more open and in question in your work. It's a, it's a long question, <laughs> but uh, I can try to, to summarize some of my experiences. One part that is important to, to say is like the, at the beginning, it was very difficult to, to work with scientists specifically because from other disciplines, also from like in 
not other, yes, from other disciplines, because most of them sometimes think more about this communication of science and not about how, what's your quest, how you share the same question and on the same questions, what you are looking for Maybe they're looking for that. I don't look in, I'm not looking for that. I'm, I'm trying to look for something else, something that gives me a hint or some special part to understand the world from poetics, especially. And it's not giving the data a, po a poetic way, but, it, but it's more of how to create a dialogue when you have a different, uh, we're going to share the same path but we are going to arrive in a, to different places, completely different places. And it's okay with that. To make them understand that is, it has been di difficult with some of them. So I, I cannot work, no, because it's hard. They, they try to pull for this kind of form that the only knowledge you can have of this pen, of this pencil is how this weight, his size, what is useful, what's the wood from this and this, but not what comes out when I'm writing or when I'm drawing. So that's mainly what I'm, and it's not what it is for. Okay, it can, you can draw and you can write or you can do a nomon, <laughs> like one of our students, <laughs> but it's, it's else, it's the content of what it comes what it came out of it. You know? mm. So, and there, I'm very interested in these, um, the tools we use to create knowledge. Mm. Because for example, with this uh, project with the 5th of April and the Schmidt Ocean residency I have, we have this incredible footage in 4K for all what we saw there and explore and some samples and everything. But there's one thing that you cannot do still underwater in that depth and it's sound. Because if you record sound, the sound will be the sound of the machine, of the rover that goes down. So what's the sound there? We're missing a lot of information. We can have the temperature, but we don't have the sense of it. Mm -hmm. So completely in this kind of perception, but in, a, in another way. Mm -hmm. So I think it has been step by step. I have a lot of anecdotes that have been informing me how to relate with, with, uh, with the specifics. Um, Ramas with specific sciences. It's, it's completely different to work with an astronomer than a physicist, than a biologist, than a geologist. Like their perception of time and space is completely different. That at some point I decided to observe the process, their own process. And I love how they question and how they see the world and how they, they approach it is completely different from some other people. So it's not taking that out of the question when you work together, because you have to understand that. And this kind of enactment gives us that opportunity because even though we were doing the same thing with the same sun and same moon, the solutions of each of us and the, there were people that didn't care about the goal, but there were other students that were really, like really, really, really worried about like uh, getting sleepy, getting tired, not being able, the frustration. So oh, it's a different experience. Well, we all know that. <laughs> Nadia, do you want to respond to this question as well about um, collaboration? And we do have so many scientists here in the, in the group, as well as artists who work with scientists who it would be lovely to hear from after we hear from you, Nidia, about your, your take on collaboration? Well, I think I'll, I'll say something that's, I think, quite obvious to everybody, but collaboration for me is about listening. Um, and learning really to listen is a very difficult thing. And we have to sometimes, as Alice says, recognize that we speak different languages, but there are meeting points. And um, I was, 
I was working with computer scientists on the on some on a knowledge base and the when when we were talking about establishing categories, for instance, um, computer scientists were basing um, their assertions on logical methods, whereas I work with historical methods, and that was conflicting for me. But then when we started running the system, I started seeing how logic and history could speak if there's a place, if there's an accepted place for ambiguity. And that was, that was a very, very important um, uh, discovery. And I'm also saying this because one of, one of my collaborators in Mexico is with us here. So <laughs> thank you for joining. And, and uh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure this will develop this in today's conversation. That's what I'll say for now. Uh, just one more thing is that um, that is also obvious, no? But we have to say it, is that any collaboration is collaboration between people, between persons. So we don't have like all our friends are from our same profession or discipline or, or what we do. And we learn to relate. And I guess one of my main things with uh, collaborating with with people is that I can that it's it's getting to know each other so we can learn the differences in our languages in our way to see the world in and how this enrich each one of us no that's it that's the basic I think mm -hmm. such interesting and and just uh, really kind of on point comments about collaboration. And there's so many people in the group today who, who are collaborators across art and science. I would love to hear you in dialogue with Ale and, and Nydia. Would anyone like to jump in? I don't, I don't wanna call people out by name and embarrass people. M. Findlay, would you like to uh, ask your question? Sure. I always get nervous to ask questions because then my voice is on the recording. <laughs> but um, how do you think that we can use science and history in combination to create like respectful fictions and art to retell these stories without losing truth, but still being able to be creative and make yeah, creative fictional works. Great question. Because I'm working with that, but with the future. And that's one of the main when in in the in these arts in in residency in so we did a couple of of um, specific aims, no? One of them was to take a rock, no, from the 3,000 meters in the seafloor. And this rock was really important because it was the rock on the side of the peninsula and not on the side of the continent. And because we have a lot of information through tools, beams, uh, radio frequencies, waves, whatever, to see the seafloor and, and to predict how the continent is getting separated and from the peninsula. But the geologists want to see the rock and to compare this rock with the rock from the other side to see they come from the same place. So I explained it very simple way, but it was important to have like it's like having the rock from the moon. And one of the projects I have is going, I'm going to tell the story of the rock. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell the scientific story of the rock. I'm not going to tell you which kind of rock it is and which belongs. It's two million years ago rock that it we take it out from the seafloor. And she has never touched touch the air. <laughs> so it's kind of wow. Obviously, nothing happened to the rock, but for me it was like it comes out and it's it comes out from 
from a very deep place and suddenly it's in, in an other world. And so how can I tell the whole process of the expedition? But it's like, and I think we can be really creative in that. And I will set some part of my, my story be free for me, but I will not, I will follow like, what they have discovered is just like setting completely setting your your rules you no know? and i think there's a lot of creativity because you know and there will be the resume what i should how should i have answered before and it's because scientists are extremely creative so they tell us a lot of stories incredible stories to make us understand you no know? They have to be creative to find out that there's a dark matter or a dark, no. They have to be creative to imagine what is happening be, be beneath the seafloor with the lava and, the, and and they imagine it because they have data and they have no, they will have the knowledge already, but they we are building no, no knowledge upon that also in a creative way because we have to imagine what to look for. So I think there's a lot of creativity and we have not, we should not stop ourselves from working with the history and retell it. I feel like after, point of view. <laughs> after this, Ale and Nydia, I feel like I've completely changed what I think of when I think that we have to imagine what we look for because that imagining itself is so incredibly detailed and textured and complex. It's not simple. It's not like a simple ideal. It's, it's, you've really radically changed how I think about how we imagine forward in our work. Judith Hersko, we're, we're so excited to hear your comments about this presentation because there are so many intersections between your work and Ale's. Yes. You're, you're on, I think you're muted. Oh, great. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Congratulations. And this is a beautiful collaboration. And, and the way that you collapse time uh, with, the, uh, with this reenactment of, of something from the 16th century um, and, and, and the way you do it and the way you involve different people, there's just something so beautiful and poetic about the, the way that collapses time and, and space, like you said. And I mean, my passion is also uh, the um, combination of history with, with the science and, and, and the art together. And I, I read narratives as well. So that's why Lisa said there is so much intersection. Um, and I was just very, very inspired by the way that the two of you have, have done this work. Um, very, very beautiful. Um, not sure that I have anything incredibly insightful or <laughs> um, wise to say about the, the process itself. I've worked with many different scientists and I went to Antarctica and worked with uh, people there in, in 2008 with the National Science Foundation Antarctic Artist and Writers Grant. And uh, all of these processes were magical, but in the end, of course, we as humans, of course, retell those stories from our own subjectivity and, and the way we weave together uh, what we get from the history and, and the stories that we weave around the science and the history and, and are obviously our own, own lens in some ways. Uh, for me, it's an unknown explorer. I invented a woman who goes to Antarctica in 1939. So my story is sort of spindle around her story and she interacts with others for real real history and and real people and real events um and um yeah i just uh, i i really related very closely to what you were doing and was very moved by it so thank you thank you thank you and i love these imaginary characters because i have them I talk to them every day. So if someone in the future wants to write about the imaginary character who doesn't have interact with me, I would love it. No, <laughs> it's like, because I, I really relate with them. No, <laughs> like I have these 
it's part of the creative process. See, I love probably, it. probably, actually, it might come from from that for me too because I did have them as a child. I, I had these characters that my whole family knew. <laughs> that existed only in here. My sister still keeps mentioning them. <laughs> Beautiful. Given the intersections between your two projects, between Judith's project with Melody Ju and Ale, your project with Nidia, it would be wonderful to do a dialogue across those two groups that we could record as an interview. So to be to be this conversation to be continued, but I'm so glad. Ale and Judith that you have met, and Nidia, have you met Judith yet? No, we haven't met before. Oh, wonderful that you have now. We have a really beautiful comment in the chat. Uh, it is from Ulyana Kachenko, and Ulyana says, I really enjoyed the point on how every project or experiment is as much about the research as it is about building community, a new community through shared experience, it definitely made me think the goals of research from a broader perspective. Yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this was especially you. important as it happened. Well, we're still we're, we're still in the pandemic, but it was last last spring. So all teaching was remote. We had all been working remotely for more than a year. And it suddenly really mattered to make observation of space of the sky connect with observation of our surroundings. And it had such a historical basis as well because cosmography was that, was the connection between the earth and the sky. And so it, it all really came together. But the, I think certainly the most exciting aspect was, was, was some of the logistics. <laughs> <laughs> it was making things travel where they had to travel and reach the people they had to reach and people acknowledging that they had their notebooks and that they were starting to observe and that com the communication of observations through discord and yeah that was it was really exciting i think we do it many times noelle yeah. and i think we we didn't feel away no we felt we like there were so many voices around all the time and it was beautiful no? mm -hmm. so wonderful we we have a, a question or comment from joe riley who is also someone working at the intersections of doing historical work and doing art practice uh, collaboratively with scientists and who is bridging those two roles as a an art practice phd student of writing a dissertation and producing a major art project at the same time for his PhD. So uh, Joe, it's also great to introduce you to Nidia, who you haven't met yet, um, even though we're all here at UCSD. So nice opportunity. Well, thank you, Lisa. And um, thank you so much for this, this presentation. It's so um, stimulating and inspiring. And I guess I was struck by the um, sort of a, a comment that you know Nidia was making earlier that had something to do with kind of a let's let's call it like a a, a sort of um, empathetic telepathy or something with um, you know these um, um, uh, Spanish kind of imperial sort of astronomers and um, and um, or you know and historical figures who are named and unnamed um, and and that 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 kind of relationality that is developing, you know, over a much long, over a long span of time, also made me wonder, sort of, if if there are, if there are um, similar or analogous relationships or kinds of um, forms of reciprocity that happen that are happening through your work, or you know, or you know, whether it's this project or past projects, um, that have to do with, you know, the impact. Um, or the the kind of like maybe a reciprocal exchange between the domains of art and science, right? So it, I'm like, oh, I, I recognize and I struggle with this in my own like kind of work and research, like instances where visual arts or 
you know, poetry or history are really directly impacted <laughs> by science, <laughs> right? Um, and, and is there a way, are there instances maybe in your experiences where your work or the kind of collaborations or interventions you've had within domains of science have sort of had a kind of, um, uh, have also had an effect in shifting how science is done or how it's approached or, or the instruments or methodologies or, you know, whatever is cosmologies even <laughs> that are being used. Um, yes, yeah, so um, as, I, as I said at the beginning, I've worked a lot with maps of the moon and a lot has been said about how art allowed Galileo through his learning of perspective to draw his moons the first time he saw through the telescope. So that argument's been made many, many, many times. And it's kind of repeatedly, repeatedly being generalized. Um, and, and so I was really skeptic and I started to look for evidence of real interactions between beyond Galileo, astronomers and draftsmen and engravers. And I did find very, very interesting cases of projects that were completed or unresolved um, only when the right engraver came along. Because it, at the telescope, one, one version of what is seen can be drawn. But then over time, the image changes. And really constructing the image is, is a temporal work that has to be achieved by not just a draftsman, but also the person who can translate the drawings onto the copper plate. And that's a very, very specific uh, skill and use of, of style, of style. And so, um, so we can talk about, about that case. It's, it's the case of a French engraver called Claude Melan and his interactions with a, an astronomer called Pierre Gassendi. And it's a really beautiful story because when you see the prints, you, uh, there's, another, there's another part of the story. There wasn't an adequate print uh, anchor, anchor at the time of the production of the plates. And so the plates weren't finished. So it's not just the draftsman, the engraver, it's also the anchor. And only, only when everything comes together, then the image happens. And then the image starts carrying information. So I, I, yeah, I, I micromillimetered <laughs> the process and, 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 and that's one case, but there are, I'm sure many, it's very exciting to look for those specific, specific cases of interactions between art and science. They're not, they're, they're complex. And I think they shouldn't be easily generalized. That's brilliant. I love that it, it, it comes down to the printers. <laughs> <laughs> In so, in so many instances, no doubt. Thank you. This reminds me, Joe, a lot of the work that you do with documents because you are in a position, as Nidia has been for so long, to notice the, the very small differences between different copies of things, between uh, where, where there is a negative, where there is an unfinished work, where there is uh, something that's dirty and been handled and how important these little details become when you do historical work with, with things as opposed to digital records. Um, so do we have any other questions or comments from the group here listening? I'm not seeing any questions or comments. Um, what I would love to do is to follow up and connect your, your group, your, your collaboration with the collaboration that we heard from um, 
was it last week, Judith, or two weeks ago? Two weeks ago, Judith and Melody Jew specifically, and uh, kind of create that as a, a break off conversation, um, perhaps with Joe's group or Joe involved as well, in terms of talking about um, the nature of doing this kind of historical collaboration in which we create um, futures through using histories. So um, another, another interaction to come. Would you like to uh, give us any kind of closing words, Nidia and Ale? Last me. I would just say that um, since we weren't able to do the workshop, we thought of different ways of maybe inviting inviting actions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, Ale, maybe you can, you can launch your idea. Well, we were talking about um, this observation process. One of the main things is uh, mm -hmm. to forget that we are not the center of the universe and think that we are, you know? because the only way we could perceive the movement without being in abstract spot is really observing it from the center that we are standing. So the first, the first measurements and the first understanding of the heavens was through the horizon. And then the horizon becomes the movement and then the movement becomes the sphere. And it's like a gradually learning of the movements in, in geometry, you know, in, a, in a spatial this, the sphere. So there's one question that uh, we were saying, like who really knows which face of the moon we are today, you know, and where it is. And we were saying like, okay, the workshop, if we have to make a workshop, we're telling like, we will ask everybody to go and see through the window because the moon should be there and start looking at it every day. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's wonderful. So leaving us there with um, not a decentering but a recentering, so that we can understand situatedness. I think is a great place to to leave it for this evening. Thank you so much, and uh, for your presentation. And this is a conversation to be continued. I'd like to invite everyone here to uh, tune in for next week when we have a presentation with Stephanie Sherman and uh, Daniel Dean who are, uh, Stephanie is a, a long-standing figure in the design lab and has been um, working on a dissertation about Fordlandia, the Brazilian um, uh, kind of company town, not kind of, the D Brazilian company town built on the Amazon River in Brazil uh, as an outpost of the Ford Motor Company. And it was a disastrous plan that resulted in deforestation and um, unfortunately, uh, a kind of inevitable understanding that you can't transpose Western industrial architecture for housing and factories and lifestyle onto a South American community and um, hope for it to work, that this was just a, a, a kind of um, an experiment in, in imperial industrial expansion. Um, and so Stephanie Sherman has been working for years on Fordlandia, and she will be speaking in conjunction with Danielle Dean. Their projects are not collaborations. They are both working on Fordlandia, and Danielle Dean has been producing a series of projects that take Fordlandia and the pun of Amazon and the Amazon platform of consumption, and specifically um, Amazon Turk, the worker platform um, and producing a series of artworks most recently in her exhibition at the Tate Modern Gallery in London, which is one of the major arts venues for contemporary artists in the world today. Um, you can see it, some of the images from it um, on the Tate Modern website now. So see you all next week when we welcome Daniel Dean, Professor of Visual Arts at UC San Diego and Stephanie Sherman. Um, Okay. Thank you, Nadia Pineda and Ala De, De La Puente. It's been Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You.
Thank you and everyone for listening to us. Yes. Thank you. <laughs>